This is Diane Hatz from Change Food, and welcome to the second episode of Change Food Eats. Um, today's guest is Lauren Cardelli. He's the founder and president of A Growing Culture, an organization that promotes promotes ecological agriculture across the globe. Lauren has a wide range of experience working with farmers in Africa, Asia, and Latin America. AGC's goal is to create a living repository for and by farmers who will use their collective knowledge to reinvent our food systems, facilitating virtual connections to previously unreachable peers across the globe. Welcome, Lauren. How are you? I am good. Hello, Diane. So how have you been coping during the pandemic? Mm. I have been coping. Um, I left my basement apartment in New York City because I didn't want to cohabitate with a bunch of cockroaches during the quarantine. How well, was the escape? Because you left at the height of it when it was really, really bad here, didn't you? No, I left right before. Oh, you did? Yeah, I left like in like March 15th or something. Okay. Yeah, so it was, it was ugly. Like, it, it was it was scary here for a couple months. Really scary. Mm -hmm. I have. I mean, I have no idea besides like testimonials from friends and pictures and news. But it's like I haven't been there, and it feels kind of weird to have, you know, departed the city you love in the time of you know when it needs the love. But I I couldn't be there. Um, we don't have a super you know comfortable living situation so I didn't want to quarantine there and I'm down in the mountains of North Carolina I'm using a hot spot on my phone so if the connection goes out I apologize to everybody but this is rural life and uh yeah how was the I can't pronounce it Asia the the not quite a hurricane storm didn't it pass through mm -hmm. you yes last night because it's here now it just hit New York City less than an hour ago yeah it was um it's been raining pretty hard on um, Friday night. We were doing a broadcast. We have a weekly broadcast called the hunger for justice broadcast. And during the closing remarks, I was holding my computer and talking right over here and I got electrocuted <gasps> through my computer. Like, oh my and it was weird. It was like storming and thundering. And I was like, all right, hope the power doesn't go out. You know, during this broadcast, we were, you know, we're, we are featuring the Korean Women's Peasant Association. It was our first broadcast, not only in English, it was in Korean. And um, yeah, closing remarks and holding all of a sudden it was like, I feel the shock in my arm, but I, I kept talking. I don't think anybody noticed, but um, my arm felt tingly for the rest of the night. <laughs> so you, know? you, you are in the mountains in North Carolina. <laughs> mm -hmm. yeah. um, so we're gonna get to your podcast in a second, but the most important question is what are you eating today? I'm like cleaning my teeth as I talk to you. I, I'm sorry. Um, I know. You know what? I'm I'm second. I'm I'm uh, not second guessing, but I'm wondering about this asking people to eat while they talk because it's more complicated than people realize. Yeah, it's you know, and I usually don't eat until later on. Um, my my routine for the day while I'm working is usually just coffee. Mm. Um, that's not good. No. It's, it's not good, but I, I need the energy. When I eat, I get, you know, my energy runs out and I'm pacing back and forth. Like I don't have a Fitbit, but my step count is pretty damn high. And, uh, and that's the problem with like my partner living in that small bedroom apartment. She's like, I can't handle you pacing all day long every day and not have be able to escape. Cause I can't talk. We're going to try this right here, but I'm going to move my hands and do because I can't stay still when I'm talking. But, um, because of, of you, Diane, and because of the immense amount of love and respect I have for you, I'm, I'm, I'm eating this morning. Um, and I have almonds, beef jerky, and apricots. Mm. So it's, it's snacking. Mm. Yeah, I, uh, I haven't cut it yet, but I have a, it's an heirloom tomato. I got to be honest, I mean, heirloom tomatoes are great. We're saving varieties of tomatoes. Give me a Jersey beef steak. And I am the happiest camper on the planet. It is like mm -hmm. old school red tomato, but this looks pretty good. It's ripe, it's ready to go. And what, you know, one of the things that gets me, so this is a tomato, you know, it's got a little brown there. It's got a little green up there. Why do people want food that's so perfect? And why does this cost so much money? Ah, <laughs> uh, well, um, 
I don't know what is perfect. Um, I don't know if my my point of views you necessarily reflect most people's point of views about perfect and, and about you know food. For me, everything is political, and I go there. Um, I don't quite get the you know the um, the community. I, I don't I don't I don't engage as much. I don't know the statistics around like food food waste um, or around these. It's food a lot. Issues, you know? It's a lot. It's like 30, 30 to fifty. Lot. Yeah. You know, but I, I mean, I don't know too much beyond the fact that like you have something like for me, like in the United States, we talk about food waste. Right. And we talk about it as a concept of like post production of like what the consumer can do. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What we don't understand is that like in the United States, like we, you know, per acre, um, our caloric production is, you know, one of the highest in the world. Right it's over twice as high as in India. And that's, we're talking about the amount of calories produced per acre. Now, the amount of calories delivered per acre are actually higher in India, right? So like wow. India feeds more people per acre, feeds more calories per acre than the United States does. Why? So we're about like at a 40% efficiency rate, right? Because our whole system, Right. Like, so when you want to look at food waste and you want to look at it as like what you waste after that you buy from the market, right. Or what a restaurant wastes, like, and you don't want to talk about like industrial agriculture and the, and the political aspect of production, which is the, the main driver. Like to me, it's kind of absurd. Um, you know, so where, where I want to talk about is, you know, ethanol production. I want to talk about subsidies. I want to talk about, feeding corn and soy to animals. And I want to talk about what the hell we're growing, right? Like, because this is, this is a reflection of all of that, right? Like, you know, I'm, I'm not as interested per se as in the, the consumer, you know, angle of that, because I think when you, when you pass the baton to the consumer's influence in the food system, what you get is an empowered elite base. What you get is, um, you know, consumer privilege and you, you know at best but then at at worst what you're getting is is passing the baton down to the people purchasing the food rather than the people making policy and and driving their food system um so I, I mean, I think, I'm, I'm confused because don't you want people at the bottom creating the demand for what they want and then shifting the system like who's I, on the bottom people consumers general consumers. Yeah. I mean, you know, the, I do want, you know, consumers to have an impact in our food system. But I think what happens is when you create the kind of language or the trends um, or the movement around um, consumer action, what you start to reveal is the layers of consumer privilege, right? So what you start to see is like what consumers, like how can they act and why can they act, right? Um, the issue is that like almost 40% of the world's population are peasant farmers right like that's right there you know the bottom right like right there our food system is designed to to produce calories not nutrition you know to consolidate control not democratize production and to protect the bottom line not the bottom billion right and like right. you know communities faced with food apartheid you know um asking for them to to change the food system in a lot of ways is can be kind of absurd because it's like, you know, the, the, what power do they have when you put the power within like consumer privilege and consumer choice all the time, right? A lot of these well, okay, situations I'm, are I am, Well, I'm gonna throw this out. Yeah. Um, I agree with you about consumer privilege and it's, it's a big problem and it's something that I wanna discuss with people during the course of this um, show because we need, well, you know what? I'm going to ask you the question I'm asking everybody. And just so people know, I'm asking every guest the same question. I don't know what's going to happen with it. I might put it together in like a mini documentary, but I want to see if something comes out of it. But what do we need to do to create a food system where everyone can eat healthy food? That's everyone. And that ties in with what you were just saying. Yeah. Um, so it's like, how much time do I have for that answer? Do, do we have over an hour or? 
you know what, Lauren, we can go on as long as you want until I fall asleep, until my dog has to go, my foster dog has to go to the bathroom. Um, you know, I think, I think food sovereignty creates a really good framework. I think you can also look at like case studies that have been implemented around the world. Um, like what uh, do we, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to keep on you because I, I want like sound bitey. I want, yeah, no, you want a sound bite. What do we thing. need? What do we need to create a fair, equitable, healthy food system? What's your opinion? Because everybody's going to have different opinions. So okay. this is the thing I'm grappling with. Is and so what if are the I, reasons if I have I'm to doing boil this? Down to if I boil it down to a soundbite, which mm -hmm. well, I, appreciate, I, I appreciate the challenge. No, I appreciate this, Diane. I really do. Um, I will. I will boil it down to. We need to support the very ones who grow our food and allow them to design, designate, and execute a food system, right? That works so for them. Can, the you, can you just say that again? We need to do what? We need to support the very ones who grow our food, right? They need to be the ones making the decisions and guiding our agricultural policy. You know, what? why I say that, now I can go in depth because the sound bites over a little bit, but the, <laughs> like, agriculture is a 10,000 year journey of injustice and injustice towards the one who grow our food. Like we talk about, the Neolithic revolution and the first seeds sown were seeds of, of wheat. Like that couldn't be further than the truth. The first seeds sown were seeds of injustice and hegemony, right? From day one, like the peasant class was under attack. As soon as you have a system that creates surplus, you have a system that creates hierarchy because who distributes that surplus and who grows that surplus. All of a sudden you have the social stratification. You have embedded patriarchy. You have, um, and, and what we're realizing now is that the very first walls built around these societies were not designed to keep people out. They were designed to keep peasants in. Peasants were running to the hills, right? Let's bring this back to like our food, right? What we're eating. Let's talk about grain, right? Because for all the paleo and gluten-free folk out there, um, I think there's a really interesting argument. I'm gonna say that I'm not one of them, um, but I'm gonna say there's a really interesting argument around that should be framed around justice, right? Like. Grain farming created a very different situation than the rest of agriculture, right? Like growing potatoes, I don't give a fuck if the tax collector is coming, I can keep those potatoes in the ground for a couple of years, right? Like the thing about grain is it all comes into season at the same time. So then a tax collector can walk the fields and calculate your tax, right? Like you couldn't do that with vegetable farming. You couldn't do that with these other models of agriculture that weren't dependent on like a strict timeline. So what happened was peasants and a lot of communities went up to the mountains, went out of these areas to grow tubers, to grow alternative crops because they were like, damn, this grain farming sucks. This grain farming is a form of bondage, right? And so what's really fascinating to me <coughs> is to understand <coughs> Excuse me, I'm gonna drink some more of this coffee. <laughs> What's really fascinating to me is, is to understand how the society that we live in today is a society that has been a perfected form of that injustice that was designed through that grain farming, right? I'm and sorry, you cut out for a second. Society today is what? Is a society that is a form a perfected form of that injustice mm. that started with grain farming mm. right when we talk about agriculture as a shift it's grain farming that led that shift you know and the social ills that we're dealing with today are all a result of that neolithic shift 10,000 years ago so what do you think about um with covid just people it just wasn't planned no one talked to each other people right and left are planting gardens they're planting more than they need there there's this huge shift do you think that might help facilitate and then just the health aspect do you think this might sort of help facilitate a run back to the hills as you said where people might want to become more self-sufficient yeah i encourage that um i mean what do you think about because you live in new york also what do you think about and this is isn't necessarily food related <clears throat> but i've been here the whole time i left for a little bit to help my mom but i've been here basically the whole time and, you know, things are starting to close. And my mail carrier told me in one week in my zip code, 10,000 people put on mail forwarding. So some are just at their second homes. This is a wealthy area now. Some have moved. 
you know, but 10,000 people in one week. Mm -hmm. So what's New York going to be, you know, and then people who can't leave, who can't afford to leave, they're hungry. You know, I just, I just worry about what's going to happen. I think everybody is worried and I think everybody should be worried. You I know? think a lot of people have their head in the sand. I think a lot of people think this is just going to blow over and they don't understand how many businesses and the impact of that small businesses are going to be destroyed. Yeah. I mean, I think there's going to be like, I mean, the same way a fire comes through a forest and, and, and breeds new growth. I think, That's you know, I think that there is going to be a resurgence and I'd love to see how many in the next wave of restaurants and business owners throughout New York city are actually, you know, led by BIPOC communities, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. I, I'm sorry. I'd, we I'd just had, we just had like an 80 mile an hour wind gust just blew oh. my window in so yeah so okay so i'm sorry I, i'm jumping around a little but no no but, but you're asking about covid right so like what is my mm -hmm. um and you're asking about how this kind of resurgence of the victory garden of the you know growing your own well that, i think growing your own is great well victory garden know? well on victory garden but also i really wonder about the mental effects of this and and if it will shift people and if they might if there might be more of a move out to less populated areas well i mean they got to i mean you know like you look at rural america it's like the you know <clears throat> the average age of these populations are are high the average age of farmers are high right mm -hmm. um if there's going to be and those economies are just are just you know hurting right if there's gonna be a shift like they need to figure out a way to to get young people and people of color into those communities right and that's a two-way process those young people and people of color are going to change those communities for the much better you know guiding them towards a direction that is much more sustainable and and spiritual and conscious but like this communities also have to do things to attract those individuals to come there and i think that shift is happening i think like sadly in the united states like economics is the driver and so sadly there's like there it's like a through a cost benefit analysis where like these governments are realizing shit we need people here right, right. um and and that is changing you know i do think that um there is like a sense, everybody's been saying this, this is nothing new, but it's like, what is going back to normal mean? Like, why should we go back to normal? Normal wasn't working. I do think there's a sense that like this pandemic is like at best case, like it's like one of the best global pandemics we could have. Like this isn't like Ebola, like this isn't something that is much like more dangerous like it's dangerous it's killing people but like there have been a lot worse in the history of the world you know climate change is going to affect us in a very different ways as well and climate change is going to be certain communities it's not going to create that global solidarity that like COVID-19 created so what we have right now is an opportunity to make a shift and I opportunity to make a transition to to a new model and this COVID-19 can be a real check and a slap in the face to wake us up to well, what do you think what do you, what do you think that model is or should be god like, I mean it's like what I want to what I think that model is like you know I think that model is something that has to be based on decentralization right I think that model is something that like I don't know how political you want me or even I want to get on this because like, you know, um, but I think there needs to be a new new way of thinking that's that's beyond the quest for infinite growth on a finite planet. Like, I think we need a rethinking model around like how to create a system that takes care of everybody. I mean, you know. Um, totally and, agree with you. I think what, what I'm grappling with and what I'm trying to figure out and the, a big motivation to doing this is I mentioned <coughs> to you before we came on that I was just watching a YouTube video from the Skull Forum, very well intended, very high level, very macro people, but it's, it's, it's the old guard, it's the white tower. Like there was a panel of, they were all white US people talking about smallholder farmers in Africa. I just, this, this top down, I guess it's, and you know, but then, then I listen to when they have power 
and they have money and they have connections because all connected together. So how is the system going to change? I'm trying to figure this out because I, I want to be part of a complete radical change because food should be free for everybody. I think food should be equitable, should be healthy, should be free. That's not going to go down well with Walmart or General Mills. You think food should be free? I think everybody, if you can't afford it, yes. Do you know at Astor Place here in New York City, um, across from Cooper Union, it's NYU and Cooper Union, so I don't know which one, I still haven't researched it, but they planted a farm. They're tomato plants, they're zucchini, they're like, and they're just planted. There's no, it, it says, don't let your dogs pee here, but nothing, no attribution is, and that's what I think. And you know, I'm doing plenty chair, so. Do I think that's going to feed everybody everything? No, I don't. But I think that communities can get together and they can provide their own food and they can grow enough that they can share with people who can't grow. I do. And that's very I mean, radical. I think, I think the perspective though that we, we have, which is in some ways like, um, you know, parallel to the, to the story you told about like all these guys from school, right? Um, it's that like, what we think in the United States is that like we are this food system. Like we think that it looks anything like New York City or like Astor Place or like the Midwest. And that's just bullshit. It just doesn't, right? Like, you know, over 70% of the world's food delivered is grown by smallholder farmers. Like that's less than five hectares, right? That's 94% of the farms in the world are small, right? That's a vast majority. That means that probably like, 95% of the ones who grow our food don't look like you and I, right? These are people of color. These are like, and so why when you have a Skull Foundation, you know, event or why when you have one of the many conferences that exist in the sustainable ag space, right? In the United States, is it just blatantly disregarding that fact that you have people that don't grow our food talking about how to grow food? Like this is absolutely bogus and bullshit. And it's like, we want to think about what works, how to reimagine a society, like, it's not about like us coming up with those answers. It's about us being open to listening and engaging with the people that do have those answers. And I could sit here for two, three, four, five, ten 10 hours and tell you farmer after farmer from around the world that is reimagining a food system and creating actual scalable impact that is transforming local economies around the world. But guess what? We don't hear about them because they're not Kimball fucking Musk. Like we don't hear about them because they're actually in other areas of the world and they're people of color. So you know what another word for like unnamed scientist is? Farmer, right? Like, mm. and that's what's happening. And these farmers, these unnamed scientists over millennia are creating models and biodiversity that actually have the potential to transform our food system, right? Like, I mean, and, and we even have it in our own country and we're not listening to it, right? Like Chris Newman in, 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 in out of DC, like, with Sylvanico Farms is doing amazing work, reimagining a decentralized food system, right? Based on the support, energy, and capital of, of black and indigenous people of color. Like, it's like that needs to be supported full stop, right? Like, I don't care about an initiative from Barilla or General Mills. Like, I don't care about another damn article in the New York Times about some asshole promoting vertical farming in a skyscraper that's gonna cost a billion dollars and further cement our food like into the hands of conglomerates. But how do we gain the traction that we're taking seriously? This is this is what I'm grappling with because of the work I'm doing the other half of my life. I'm getting into more into that world and I wanna I wanna see how we can I don't want to just become a cog in that wheel, that big ivory tower talking head wheel that talks and doesn't listen. Well, I do think people are well-meaning. I don't know how many are profit-driven and how many really care, but yeah, it's a conundrum. So you said you think we need to decentralize and that's the, your solution. So explain what you mean by decentralizing food or decentralizing things. What I'm saying is that like in our current model of agriculture, we produce enough food for almost 11 billion people, but yet in a population of seven and a half billion, 1.2 billion go to bed hungry. That equation doesn't work unless injustice is present, 
right? Like we want to talk about food, right? Let's look at chocolate. West Africa produces over 75% of the world's chocolate, right? But then you hear some concept like Belgium chocolate. What the fuck is that? There's no such thing as Belgium chocolate, right? Like, like there is West African, right? And what happens is we create a society where less than 2% of the $100 billion revenue goes to West Africa, right? So like, we want to care about these little like non-GMO certifications or these like ecological, regenerative, whatever. But like, I don't care if all those farmers are organic or regenerative, they're still getting screwed by the system. And that system is, they're being screwed because we have a system where the rules are set up by the corporate conglomerates and the monopolies. This, this is the thing, I, I agree with what you're saying. How can you be you, be taken seriously and have an impact? Like, is just fighting the machine the answer or is it taking your message into the machine to get the machine to change? So I'm not saying start working for- I mean, I think it's kind of funny here because it's like, I'm not worried about me being taken seriously, right? Like, um, I don't take industrial ag seriously. Like, you know, like they, they, like their statistics and their information is bogus. It's just not like they don't feed the world. They're not more efficient. Like, it's just like, I'm, and I'm tired of acting and engaging them in a way which further perpetuates understanding that like they're needed in the equation when they're just not like, like that it's absurd. Like for every, you know, kilowatt of energy put into a small older farm, the average is 10 to 30 kilowatts out for industrial ag, the average is one and a half kilocalories out. So like, let's talk about fucking efficiency. It's not even there. And it's like, and like, I think when we enforce this narrative of them being have to be like countered in that aspect, like I, I just, I don't know if it works and I could be wrong. Like I take the indigenous smallholder and peasant farming communities that we work with absolutely seriously. And I worked with them to support their local initiatives, their local collaborations, their cooperatives, their their messaging, their campaigns. And I and I and I and I'm basically if you want to ask about a spirit animal, I'm a damn sponge because I just learned from all those communities and soak that in. You know, like I think what we have to do is like what is right. And what's right is to support the very ones who grow our food and to have them at the seat at the table. I and agree. I, you know, I agree. I'm trying to get to something because yeah. because somebody could counter and just say to you, well, you're just ta a talking head. Why are you different than the people in the white tower? Like, what are you doing? What, what libraries could you be creating? Like, what are you doing to help solve this problem yeah. to shift things? I'm <laughs> dropping library. you a hint there, Lauren. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know, but, um, but I, I feel that like, at like, my point is that like, I can go on the interwebs, right? And I could find a million case studies from academic researchers of why agroecology works, right? The UN and the Special Rapporteur to Food has released report after report since 2010 showing that agroecology and smallholder and diversified farming systems right. like are more efficient and everything. Right. Yet, what is happening? Nothing. Like there's no change. The situation has gotten worse. So it's like, in some ways, like people feel like we need to make the case, make the case, make the case. And I think when you engage in that kind of thought that's saying we need to make the case, what you're doing is validating the other side that you're making the case against. And I'm like done with that. Cause I just like, I don't get it anymore. Like, I don't get it, but okay, so what I'm we are a doing is creating a library, Okay. right? Called the library for food sovereignty, which is the world's first like indigenous smallholder and peasant farmer designed built and executed and led like knowledge commons. Now this isn't necessary to make the case. This is, this is a, a, a digital knowledge platform that mirrors the mycelium network beneath our feet, right? It's, it's, that, it's, that, it's that wood wide web, right? It's that connection of shared impact and resources and knowledge so that like groups all over the world can learn from each other because farmers in Cambodia should be learning from farmers in Kenya who are learning from farmers in but how does it work? You're, you don't, don't assume, like, I know nothing about your library. How mm -hmm. does it, what, what, do you, what are you doing with it? What is the point of it? A library to me is you're taking out books, but aren't people taking their expertise to share it with others? Yeah, so this is, I mean, it's, it's you can think of it more as like a, a Wikipedia in some ways. Like it's, it's basically, it's a knowledge commons. So what happens is groups in our network, smallholder, indigenous and peasant farmers, like they, 
they document their successes, their failures, their case studies, their innovations, their knowledge, and they can share it with each other. So they learn from each other's successes and failures because what farmers do and what farmers don't do needs to be understood. Farmers do not adopt, they adapt, Correct. right? When we think of this damn story of that, like that, that guy, Isaac Newton, right? Think sitting under a tree with the apple hitting his head. Like, I hate that story. And if I ever have kids, I'll never tell them that story. Like, because it's absurd. Because what it perpetuates is a thinking that like genius and these brilliant ideas are a result of an independent thought in an isolated mind, right? Like, like what we should know of Isaac Newton is that he said, if I have seen further than others, it's by standing on the shoulders of others, right? right. Like, that like it's like the revolution might not be televised but it will be open source like and like this is what's happening all around the world there's like the need to collectivize innovation while democratizing the information and that's what the library for food sovereignty does it serves as a platform to support the actual work which is analog on the ground groups innovating it's for farmers groups. it's it's geared toward farmers yes Okay, that's fine because plant each share. We're developing a database, but it's for people, not for but gardeners and people who want to grow food and share it. But it's a similar thing to what you're doing. Is I, you know, I think that people could find like somebody in Iowa can see what somebody in Oregon is doing, take it and adapt it to their area, and then put that information back into the database for some other communities, and then people can share knowledge. I mean, that I have to say, for me, out of COVID, probably the the most hopeful thing an inspirational thing has been the mutual aid network, like everything people just, and I'm one of them just independently started helping their neighbors. And this, this global network of people from the, on the ground, well, I'm not a mutual aid group. I'm completely independent, but I call it that to explain, but it's just people just started doing it. And I think the key is like with farmers, farmers are doing what they do and then getting them to share information so other people can take it and adapt to their area, I think is the way to go. And you don't need the ivory tower. Yeah, but th this is the thing is like farmers have been do like this, like this mutual aid network is like, is like new to, to us in New York City, right? Or to Westchester County or Colorado or wherever, right? Like, like where that isn't new to is like the farmers of the world. And when I talk about farmers, I'm not talking about Joel Sal Salatin. I'm not talking about a Christian man in overalls. Like I'm talking about the real farmers of the world. Like they're involved in this collective cooperative modeling of shared resources on like labor bartering, right? right. Like, well, that could is, be where it came from, Lauren. I mean, don't diss the mutual aid network because even if because I'm not it's dissing new, the mutual aid network, what I'm what I'm saying is that like this is the emphasis for what I'm doing. It's time for people around the world to start listening to communities of color, to start listening to these communities around the world that are actually doing this. Because if they were listening, it wouldn't take a pandemic. For us to think about mutual aid that's my whole point was that like it doesn't take this kind of issue because these situations have been going like um on our hunger for justice broadcast right we featured this but guy tell named, us about the but, but back up a second and just explain to anyone who might not know what the podcast is like tell us a little bit about what it is when you have it etc yeah so the hunger for justice broadcast was it's it's a webinar and it was designed to to be a response to to covid as covid has kind of pulled the layers of the proverbial agricultural onion, right? Like it's exposed the blatant injustice and white supremacy that exists within our food system and our society, right? So the hunger for justice was um, a chance to look at these case studies of resiliency and success and innovation around the world and build global solidarity, right? Um, so we've been every week featuring amazing groups from around the world. This Friday, we have Elizabeth Mopofu. If you don't know who that is, then you should, right? Because if you're a food activist and you don't know who that is, then you're not a food activist because the largest membership organization in the world is called Wavia Campesina. It's not Red Cross. It's not, you know, whatever, whatever. I don't even know. But like it's 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 Wavia Campesina, which is over 300 million peasants, right? And if that word makes you uncomfortable, then listen to it again. Peasants, self-proclaimed peasant farmers, right? Though that community is guiding La Via Campesina. La Via Campesina's impact is so large that FAO had to bring in chairs to dedicate to them because this is the voice of the peasant movement. This is the voice of the community that the food movement is purporting to serve, 
right? Now, Bavia Campesina's general coordinator is Elizabeth Mapufu. She was spe speaking this Friday, right? Um, you go to growingculture.org slash HFJ or go follow us on social media. You'll get all the information to tune in. Last week, we had the Korean Women's Peasant Association. The week before, we had KMP, which is the Filipino Peasant Movement. This is a group in Philippines, right? That is dealing with like the largest number of activist killings in the world in 2019 was in Philippines under the Duterte, yeah. like, like at Duterte administration, right? Brazil came in second. Now listen to this, like in the Philippines, 90% of farmers don't have access to land because of the feudal policies that US put in place during occupation and colonialization, right? Those policies are still in place. There has been campaigning for land reform and there's been government promising of land reform, but Duterte has further entrenched land into corporate monopolies. Okay, so when so, farmers so are campaigning, they're getting murdered. For non-activist people, what's feudal policy? For people feudal who don't policy is like the feudal systems, right? Like, so it's like, it's like, we know about like the UK and the empire, like, you know, like, like the feudal systems of land ownership that were put in place, right? Um, that are incredibly hierarchical and that are designated through corporate or land ownership or family ownership, right? And so this system has created per like peasants and serfs rather than democratize ownership of land, right? So what happens is these communities don't have access to land. They right. can't get it. And so what happens is when they're campaigning against this, they're getting shot. And in the Philippines, it's about a farmer every four days is get his gun down. And that farmer is women, children, and men, right? There was massacres, like nine, so how does that change? I mean, I'm not trying to cut you off, but how does that change? Because there's so many horrors and we just get horror after horror after horror. And it is horrible. But, but some would be like, well, what can I do? Like, how do I change? Can I buy a certain food? How do I, what does one do? Well, see, I mean, that's the thing. It's like, honestly, I don't think we get horror after horror after horror. Because I think most of the horrors aren't heard. <laughs> and I think that's the problem. Like, I don't think like people know that. Like how many people... Like you go to a farmer's market and ask them if where people, where farmers are getting killed. Like they won't be able to tell you, you Philippines, right? Like they won't know about this stuff. So I think, I do think knowledge is power. And the second thing I think that we have to understand that like our administration with Trump, it empowers entrenches like Duterte's hold, right? Like they are two peas in a damn pod, right? And that's the reality. Like there needs to be system change. Like if we had a government that we should have, there could be pressure. There could be pressure onto people like Duterte to change this policy and stop creating these human rights violations and stop murdering his own people. But he's been massacring people left and right since he came into office. And we don't have the backbone of an administration to say something. So yeah, you can vote, you know, but you're also, when you're buying these, these products, like, are there any companies that are offering real support of Filipino farmers? Like I can maybe name a couple of them like at best, but I don't know enough to make a promise that they are. But like when you buy Sunkiss mangoes in your dried bag that are covered in sugar, what does that mean? It's not helping, right? Those are those corporate monopolies that own the land. But this is the thing you're saying they're not helping, but how are they not helping? Like I'm, I'm just pretending I'm Susie Q in the suburbs and I wanna do something. I'm hearing all this, this law, oh my God, it's so horrible. My son kissed mangoes in sugar. I know they're not bad for me, but I didn't realize I was killing farmers. Like, how does one know what to do, what not? Like, would you say most industrial food? And that's, you can't do blanket statements like that. And I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to, I'm, gonna go, I'm not trying to, I'm not trying to argue or get on you. I'm really trying to drill in to see if we could come up with like some ideas. Because I think what we're programmed to say is that you what, like what people want me to say, which ties into like the U.S. food movements like point of view is like, oh, buy from this one brand, right? Like buy from this, this brand and like everything will be solved. And that's what we want so damn bad. And I'm not going to do that because it's absolutely absurd. Mm. Because if that brand existed, it would be so high cost that the people that, so much of our population wouldn't even be able to buy that damn brand because it'd be like the equivalent of Gucci on the Whole Foods model. Like, well, aisle, like quinoa, just look at quinoa. But what this is what happens quinoa? is we create this like, and that's consumer privilege. It's like, so like what, you can buy 
from this superfood company that's like doing fair trade. But if we even think fair trade is enough, it's bullshit. It ain't enough, right? And there's very few organizations, and I'm talking about companies out there that are actually creating equity sharing models. There's very few that are exporting with equity sharing models, mm. right? Like, and, and maybe we should ask those questions and put pressure on those companies rather than all those environmental certificates because all those farmers could be growing on organic land, but they could still be getting shot and like underpaid, right? Like, and that's the reality of the situation. Like we prioritize environmental impact over social impact because we wanna remove the social aspect of our food system when, when it's absurd because the food system is how we organize ourselves, right? What it's you, the birth of how we organize ourselves. What do you think about just migrant workers in the US? But that's the same thing. How many people go to a store asking about how that animal was treated and how many people go into that same well, store to ask about how that workers were treated? I actually think more people ask how the animal was treated than how the workers are treated. And I do think that is uh, a fault or uh, an oversight of the food movement. And I'm listen, I'm guilty because I worked on anti-factory farming stuff and I was not aware of how bad things were for the human part of it. I know about the animals, but I do think awareness, people are becoming more aware, but like, and maybe with COVID because there's not as many workers in the fields picking But crops. just a moment ago, you were like saying, we hear horror story after horror story, but obviously those horror stories weren't reported. And that's why people weren't aware. And that's why people need to know. Because, well, this is what I'm getting at is that people turn off after a certain point. And there are some people who just the way, and I don't, I'm not saying change, Lauren. You know, I love you and I want you to be you yeah, of all the time. But to get to certain types of people, if you tell someone over and over again, don't eat a, don't eat a Big Mac, they're going to go buy five Big Macs. Like there's this, this shutoff point for people. So if, if people are just told like, this is horrible, everyone's dying, the world's, they just go, well, there's nothing I can do. And they go into a shell. I'm just trying to dig into what you're saying to see if we can find points at which people can jump off of to do something else i understand but the thing about it is like as a nonprofit, like as a nonprofit, they create a system where who's that where you need to communicate like the, like we're in a system in the nonprofits to fundraise mm. right mm. we're in a system where we have to look at these privileged communities and empower them to get the funding to work with these other communities that we want to work on right and like this year i've kind of made a commitment like I am not going to chase funding. I'm not going to chase like rich philanthropists to get them on board, right? We're gonna do everything we can to support the very groups that we want, that need the support, right? And as an organization, we exist. And so every day we have calls from farmers from Philippines to Palestine, to South Korea, to Kenya, to Zimbabwe, to Bolivia. Like we are working with groups all over the world to support them in their campaigning and their programming, but there's not a one size fits all. Like, and we think about this scalable solution. So I can't give you like a general solution because every one of these groups are doing something very different to confront a very different issue, right? But the issues are all tied down to one thing, an extractive and exploitive system of farmers, right? Right. I and mean, so I, think, I, think, I think you have a solution and I think you're underplaying it. I think What's your library, I think, I think things like your sovereignty library, I think the food sovereignty library, that is the way to go and that's like a, and, I, and i'm biased because that's a model i operate under but like you know i try to provide platforms for people who are doing the right thing yeah Your but see, I, I don't think the i, I say personally like i love the library and, and we work the library but the library isn't the solution because like we design our programming to support local innovation and research right and so we design the way we engage with communities under um a, a metaphor of the three sisters. The three sisters is the brilliant um, model of indigenous cultivation in the United States, which was beans, squash, and maize, right? And so you have the beans that fertilize everything we do. That's our capital support. Like we get resources and capital to these communities to support innovation, to give birth to these ideas that transform food systems, right? Our squash, it covers the ground and protects the soil, 
It's the protector and nurturer, right? And the connector. Like that is the library for food sovereignty, but it's also our digital and media campaigns. It's our communications. It's the, it's the way we communicate to build global solidarity and connect people around the world to have strength in numbers. And right. then our, our maze, our maze programming is designed around the concept that like maize grown in a monoculture is exploitive, right? But maize grown in a polyculture literally provides a support for everything to climb up. Funders, philanthropists, and the privilege exist in that monoculture. They exist in that monoculture in this world where their society has been built and designed for them in the same way that industrial agriculture was designed for maize. And so what we do is a way to decolonize philanthropy and fundraising and able to get these individuals to exist in a polyculture. Right. And so like when I think of like the library for food sovereignty being this digital platform that exists outside of actual capital, actual reparations, actual advocacy work. Right. Like I think of it as as exploitive as as may is grown in a, in, a, in a monoculture. I think any program needs to be looked at through a lens of a polycultural thinking and a holistic approach. Like we need to exist, like our campaigns can't exist without actual funding and support of these groups. And we need right. to do all three of these together. Right. Okay. I um oh this is Crimson. She just came out of a van from Tennessee. She, she's came out of a van from Tennessee? Yeah, she's a rescue. I foster. She's a foster. So she's up for adoption, everybody. Can, how do people can adopt this, this beautiful animal? Social teas, social teas, NYC, T-E-E-S. Um, and I'm sorry, I'm not trying to change the subject. I, I get, you inspire me and scare me at the same time. Yeah, I think it is scary. I mean, I think it's, I think this pandemic is scary and I think this pandemic has has shooken us all and I think that like the reality is it's scary like it's like you know what it means to be a black person in this country is scary right and the problem is that like so much of our population didn't have that fear and that's why we perpetuated the systems okay. of injustice and I think it's time for us all to get a little bit fucking scared right <laughs> like for all of us to like to mobilize but like I think the general thing that I'm trying to communicate, Diane, is that like, I don't have the answers. Like, I am the one nonprofit out there that's saying I don't have a damn answer. It's not about me. It's about the ones who grow our food. Like, all but we that's can your do, answer. But that's your answer. But that all we can do is support and elevate those communities. Correct. Because they know, have the knowledge. It's not Correct. about white savior complex. It's not about top down. It's the exact opposite. Exactly. Just like Cesar Chavez said, it was never about lettuce and grapes. It was always about the people. And the food movement has fucking lost that. They've lost that. They, it's, it's, they need think, to tap into it. But tell me, tell me what you think. I think over the last, uh, not quite 10 years, maybe just say seven years, eight years, I think the food movement's really changed. I think since big food, like when I started 20 some years ago, it was, it, it was different. It was a lot different. It was before startups. It was before Walmart was selling food. You know, it was, it was a very different. I do, I do agree with you because I've also been thinking about that myself. The, I feel like the, the advocacy food movement has become corporatized. Of but I also- Corporatized, you know, regenerative ag is a brand. It's nothing else. But I guess I wonder, is that, is that how, I know movements evolve under, you know, they go through phases. Like, is that how things evolve and how do we stop it? It's a natural evolvement, but how do we stop it from self combusting? It's not, it's, but the thing is, it's because it was never a movement. It was a trend. And I don't think no, we ever had no, a food I movement. don't agree with you. I don't agree with you. Why? I, because what is there the are, movement? sorry. Show me a movement in the history of the world that wasn't populist driven, right? Like it who's became at the who's populist at the, driven? It became populist driven because it's, it's people, not populist driven today. Well, that's what I'm saying is it's changed. Well, I like, think. Go ahead. In the last 15, 20 years, right? I'm I'm not. I haven't been steeped in this for longer than that, right? What I've seen is the holding up of chefs, scientists, 
and journalists. I've seen the same white man talk over and over again about our food system through a lens that is void of social justice or any kind of populism. Like I've seen companies come out praising all the ecological footprint with not a damn thing about workers, right? I mm. don't see farmers being celebrated. And if it's a farmer being celebrated, it's somebody like Joel Salatin, which is ridiculous. Like, it's not like, like so until our food movement gets po populist, right? Until we care about the very ones that grow our food and put that up front. Like when we go to a food conference, there shouldn't be a token farmer. There should be a token not farmer. <laughs> like until that happens, we don't have a movement. We have a trend. And that trend is what happens is where you have Blue Hill, which is a restaurant, which the vast majority of people don't like can't afford. So like, I'm not going to give you accolades for like putting healthy, good food on rich people's plates. Like, and that's what we've created a system of. And that's what the food quote unquote. Movement okay. has done. How does it change? How does it change by moving out the way and supporting the groups that need to be supported? Like there's amazing farmer networks and groups, the National Young Farmers Coalition, yeah. right? There's a there's a family farm coalition of the of you know which is a chapter of La Via Campesina. There's you know Southern cooperatives and there's you know Forty Acres and a Mule and there's Soul Fire and there's Sylvanaqua and there's these groups that should be having a platform much more than Michael Pollan. Right, like there's these groups. But and you know I, what I gotta, I gotta say, this. Michael Pollan would agree with you. Michael Pollan would be the first person that would agree with you. I don't think, you know, in that whoever that that white man is you're talking about, I don't fault the white man who's up on a pedestal. I fault the people that put him there and keep him there. I, I think it, I, I fault per anybody who talks about our food system in a way that's void from the social aspect because mm -hmm. like, like that's what I fault. So when so, you read this kind of commentary, right? That exists out there. Like, like, like these people have a platform, but they have a platform, they have readership and engagement. They have the ability to say. And if you think these individuals aren't intellectual enough to connect the dots to racism, right? But how often, like go read Omnivore's Dilemma and, 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 and find how many times he mentioned the word racism, right? I don't think that was the point of the book. Like, I mean, I don't, how he can was you not... talk about the food system without talking about colonialism, without talking about slavery, without talking about the injustice that it was built on? Like, because you he, know... was, he was focused on animals and factory farms. He was not focused on. And I think now, I, I think now, especially with the Black Lives Matter movement, I think now is the time that we can talk about racism. I think that I think a lot of people just don't know. I don't even want to say they're ignorant because if you start blaming a person for what they don't know, they're going to get turned off. And, I, and again, I'm sorry, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. This is just what I believe. Sure. I, I think you're 100% correct with what you're saying. I also think that there's a guilt um, when, when people start to realize that the food I'm eating has been at the expense of somebody else. So, so again, it goes back to that you don't want people to turn off. You want people to want to do something. I think the fault of us in the movement or whatever we're in is we're not giving enough actionable, realistic steps that people can take. And the old vote with your fork, that's great. I mean, I've said that a lot, but like... But I think there's just like, you have to call out privilege. And like, when you call out somebody asking and caring more about the animal than the workers, right? Like you're talking and you're saying, don't blame them if there's a lack of intellect or knowledge on that subject. So if you're researching, if you're a New York Times best author I'm and saying researching it's a process. I'm saying it's for five process. years, but what I'm saying is if you're, if you're a researcher and researching for multiple years to create that book, right? And you haven't come across those issues, that's ridiculous. Like you made that decision to not put that in the book. And I think this is part of like the spearheads of the food movement, quote unquote, over the last 15 years, haven't wanted to get into that information and to those kind of statements because it doesn't sell. It doesn't sell and it scares people, Diane. I'm not disagreeing. You could be 100% correct. I, I, from where I stand, I think people just might've been more scared because they didn't have the knowledge, they didn't have the sensitivity, they didn't know what to do. 
I mean, I think it's like, you know, we've been talking about police killings for, for a long time in America, right? Like this isn't like it's, it's new. This has been happening. We've been talking about like xenophobia for a long time in America. We've been talking about the exploitation. You wanna talk about the chicken industry and understanding how they bust people up from El Paso to undercut black workers who were asking for raises. So they brought in migrant labor. This has been happening for a very long time. Like, and these systems are there and it's documented. Right. When we choose not I'm to- I'm getting back to how is it gonna change? Because, because where I come from, the work I've done has been to educate people and say, okay, don't buy this, you know, get to know your local farmer. What else can you do? Like, I don't, I, I agree. I don't want people buying factory farm chicken, you know, and chicken that goes through a horrible, massive processing plants where people are treated horribly. And I still think processing, even with all the workers that have gotten COVID um, and there has been some like reporting about it, but people still don't understand processing and what happens I think a lot of people would be uh, leaning more toward plant-based if they knew what happens to an animal, like not just the animal, but how it, what happens to the meat to get to your plate. Because mm. people don't, I, and I haven't had a lot of friends say, I don't want to know, don't tell me, I don't want to know. I mean, I think the, I think that the, so what people can do is to, to educate themselves on the actual system and to understand that we need real systemic change. This is that where this systemic change. You're not going to change it by an ingredient. You're not going to change it by buying fair trade almonds, even though they're good. But this is what oh, I just have my microbiome mapped. I can't have almonds. Do you know what I can't eat? I can't eat broccoli, spinach, cabbage, or Brussels sprouts. Broccoli and spinach were like the mainstays of my diet. Oh, and I have a cucumber virus. No cucumber. Oh, I don't understand this. It's a privilege thing. I'm sorry. I have my no, gut. No, I don't understand. Why can't you eat it? Well, the cucumber, I have a virus that cucumber plants get. I have it in my intestines. And then the spinach, broccoli, um, I think it's the oxalates. And there's something else I can't pronounce. They're affecting my digestive system. I'm eating too much, basically. I don't vary my diet. And nobody has, I don't think anyone has a completely varied diet. Most people, I would say everybody. I think it's very hard these days because you get your two things or your 10 things and that's all you eat and your body will build up resistance. And I think a lot of people don't realize that you can get, like I had a potato virus first time around. Now I don't because I got retested, but I have a cucumber virus. So they're viruses that the plants actually get, you get them if you're eating a plant that has the virus. But that's not what we're talking about. I digress. I think you lost me there. The, the fault, oh, I know because we got into. I just have no, I, I never heard this stuff. Really? Mm -hmm. Oh, you will when you're about 40, 45 and you start having digestive issues, you'll go, whoa, what is that? And then they'll say, oh, you've been eating too many almonds. <laughs> if you eat too much of one food, you can develop a resistance to it. But there's also, there are viruses in plants. So if you eat the vegetable or the fruit, you can get it in your body. This, it's a whole new area. But going back to like the food movement, and, and I agree with you, people need to educate themselves. I think what saddens me is that's what I've been doing for 20 years and it just hasn't just it's like so much work still needs to be done you know and it's great like what I think is great there were no degrees in food systems and all that type of thing I think it's great that so many people want to get into it now because maybe we'll, someone will come up with that I mean, what I'm having to do with the show, I think I told you, is turn it into a talk show where there eventually will be segments where people on the ground, where people giving up. So people can become educated by watching Late Night with Diane and Change Food. Um, because I don't think people are going to- Are you going to be a Late Night program? I don't know, Lauren, maybe. I want to be the Graham Norton of food. I just am not a comedian. You want to be daytime? Maybe daytime, maybe all the time. Maybe the, I don't know. You're going to help me figure that out. You're going to have your own channel. Like, oh. Yes, my own YouTube. It's a change for YouTube channel. I just got a thing from YouTube. We just hit 500 subscribers, which might not seem a lot to people, but it is actually a big deal. They just gave a big congratulations because at a thousand, we can use YouTube studios. So once we get to a thousand. I don't, are you sure? Anybody watching, subscribe. Yes. Nonprofits yeah, right. can. Yes. Um, well, we can use YouTube's studios already no you have to have a, unless you have a thousand subscribers mm. on your channel 
Yes, we do. Uh, you do? I think so. Well, put it this way. You can't go in right now. Nobody can go. You know Nobody what I mean? There's a pandemic going on. Oh, so YouTube studios, like actual, like. Physically, they have an entire professional recording studio, a whole set. And then people who have 10,000 subscribers or more. Oh, 10,000. No, no, no. That's for profits. Nonprofits, it's 1,000. And there's a massive studio here in New York City. So I want to, I'm doing this right now, this interviewing people, and then I'll eventually do segments. But the goal is to get enough subscribers and then to be able to go into the studio and do it more professionally and just have And you don't have YouTube. to pay for the studio? Nope. It's all free. So I can go. <laughs> you have to have subscribers first. I think we do. Okay. We okay. Oh. But then you can. Wow. But you, what I'm trying to tell you is during the pandemic, you're not going to be going anywhere. So. Well, damn it. The, yeah, that's good. You know, so, okay, so we should probably wrap it up because our half hour conversation is now at 61 minutes. Yeah, Ooh. yes. <laughs> but, but do you have any final words? I mean, yeah. I think this is great. I hope, I hope that more and more uh, college age, you know, younger people or even retired people, it doesn't matter your age, but that people new to the movement will come in. And I, and I, I hope more people will be more ground up. Yeah, they're going to be smarter than us. And oh, that's yeah. what's awesome. It's not a lot. a lot more, right? Yeah. yeah, and they also, they're going to have some years, they're going to have years of trial and error of other people to learn from, to not make those mistakes. You know what I mean? Like, I think that the people who came before me did a fantastic job. Um, well, yeah. I guess what I want to encourage everybody here to do Sorry, all that yeah. talk about plant based was making me eat jerky. Mm. <laughs> I love you. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> he, mm. So, please tune in to the Hunger for Justice it's every Friday. It's another amazing group. Um, this week, Elizabeth Mpofu. The next week after that is Land Workers Alliance from the UK. The week after that, UTT from Argentina. Um, and then we have the um, Council of Grannies from the Maori um, in New Zealand coming in. We have, I mean, there's amazing, amazing sessions, one after another of groups that you should know about, that know this food system better than me, better than us, and that it's important to listen to and learn from, right? We shouldn't prop up an individual. We shouldn't prop up a spearhead. We should prop up each other and listen and learn and unlearn a whole lot of bullshit about this food system. And because I gave you a Cesar Chavez quote, I want to say one more, if that's okay, Diane. Mm -hmm. You do it. Um, so this journalist from the New York Times was sent to follow Caesar. She followed him for a few days and was just blown away at the amount of love and respect that these farm workers gave him. She said, how do you explain that here in respect that these farm workers have for you, Caesar?" And he smiled and looked at her and he said, the feeling is mutual. That is what we need. That's what makes a movement, not consumer privilege, a mutual feeling of respect. I agree. So how can um, people, if they want to learn more about you? Growingculture.org, donate. I mean, if you're really cool, you want to do a monthly donation. Go on, do like a five, 10, 50, 20, oh, hundred dollar donation. Okay, okay. No asking for money. Oh, well, you never told me that and why not? That's fine, you can. You can do whatever you want. Um, yeah. Do you, Doesn't what, make me richer. So what do you think about, do you ever know any of the farmers you work with? Do they ever do Kickstarters or campaigns? And do you ever, like, I'd be happy to promote if, if somebody, because this is the thing is I can't go to my farmer's market and support a farmer, a small farmer in Africa. But do, but do they ever do like Kiva or is there, is yeah, that we also like, we also sponsor that. So if you support us, we'd sponsor more programs. Like it's like, and we're a 501c3 charity. So it's, it's tax deducted. I know I can't ask, but that's, you're asking me to, you know, no, you can, you can do whatever. Pay. So if people gave money, if people donated to you, the money that you get into a growing culture goes to support farmers and their farming yeah, around we, the world. 
let me explain something. Our organization doesn't have any full-time employees. We don't even have enough resources to pay healthcare or anything. Like this is an activist network. And the vast majority of these resources go straight to the communities, goes to developing communications and support and legal assistance to all these groups. It goes to incubating programs around the world that are community-led and community-driven. This is what our organization does. It's not, we don't have offices like Oxfam, right? Like we don't have like a headquarters like Charity Water. Like that's not what we are. Right. Um, you know, there are, um, for a lot of American farmers, there's a lot of GoFundMes, you know? I, I, I suggest everybody go check out Savanaqua's farm. They're doing a fundraise right now. How Capital do you spell raise. that? Savanaqua. Savanaqua. Chris Newman, he's doing the farm down in DC. It's, it's really incredible. It's indigenous and black led um, farm. I would recommend people to support if you're in New York, go on Amber Tam's GoFundMe, support. And let's, let's work together to get Seneca Village, the historical site, turned it to a community garden for black and brown folk in the United, I mean, in New York City, right? She's got an amazing message. Go check out Amber Tam. There's a million other farms to support. Don't just support the best known ones. Support Great. them all around. And follow AGC. I do. Yeah. Um, okay, so I think that's it. We went way over what I thought we would, right. which I'm very happy right. about. No, don't be sorry. I'm very happy that we did. I knew it would be an, a, an in-depth, passionate discussion with you, Lauren. So I thought, because you got me on these, on these almonds. It's giving me all this energy. So I just want to say thank you to everyone. Um, I will see you next week at 1230. So the way we're doing the program, it might be a half hour, but as you just saw with Lauren, it could be an hour or more. So thank you, Lauren, and be well. And I hope to see you here in New York soon. Yes, thank you, Diane. You're okay. awesome. Love Change Food. Thanks. Change Food, signing out. <laughs>